ah, yes, that awkward moment when you realize you and a couple of your friends are all doing build videos for the same sponsor in the same week. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. This week I built a nice little scenic diorama model thing using a really nice model from Arch Villain Games. And right as I was starting to build this thing, I realized that two of my friends, Emil from Squidmar Miniatures and Neil from Real Terrain Hobbies, were also doing build videos with models from the same company in the same week. Why not make it a sort of light friendly challenge and do 24 hour diorama builds? Emil and Neil, I think, are actually going balls to the walls and doing theirs in one 24 hour stretch. But the week I made this is the week that my daughter is starting grade one. Uh, like literally I was working on this on her first day of school. And not only is it the first day of school, it's the first day of school amidst COVID craziness. So I couldn't do that to my wife and my daughter to just disappear for 24 hours straight building something. I had to do it in two chunks. So to make it more challenging and fair, I limited myself to two eight hour build sessions, giving myself actually only 16 hours to complete this project, including painting the mini. I think that's a fair trade off, limiting myself to 16 hours in two chunks versus one 24 hour chunk. The first thing I had to do was pick a mini and I was sent a whole bunch of really cool concept art. But when I saw the polar bear, I knew that's the one that I had to pick. I'm from Manitoba, which happens to be the polar bear capital of the world. I literally live within walking distance from the International Polar Bear Conservation Center, and I can go have lunch right beside polar bears any day of the week I want. Polar bears are really culturally significant to this province, so I wanted to do a little diorama that you know, honors that and specifically is kind of a little tribute to the town of Churchill, Manitoba. I printed off the bear the night before, so it was ready and waiting for me to clean up and use. The model came with a few pose options as well as some different options for weapons and hands. I picked the pose that I thought was most dynamic for a little scene and opted for the ax instead of the sword because I don't know, it just felt right. I still find it incredible that in my own home, I can materialize these detailed miniatures out of liquid. This is some seriously sci-fi future stuff. It might not be a machine that makes cheeseburgers on demand, but uh, it's still pretty cool. Because I was on a time crunch and I knew most of it would be taken up painting the mini, I cheated again. Uh, and I used a base that I already had made. Remember this thing? Yeah, this is the one that was ruined by a really bad resin reaction in a previous video. Well, I had salvaged it and put it aside for an occasion just like this. It's a little bit small for a diorama, but hey, that's okay. I had really been itching to use it, so I did. I wanted to try to use the same resin that previously went crazy on me, but this meant that I'd need to ensure there was zero moisture present on the base when I poured it. And since I would have no time to ensure that PVA was fully dry before pouring the resin, I decided to use super glue. I primed both pieces in black and then did a really heavy zenithal prime on the bear, since he would mostly end up being white fur anyway. At first, I just did a tan dry brush on the base to look like stone, but I started thinking about images of what it actually looks like underwater under ice. I decided to go a bit more stylized and dry brush on some rich blue and aquamarine colors. This basically ended up invisible in the final piece because of various factors, but I think the idea was solid and would look really cool had it ended up being more visible in the end. I honestly didn't know the best way to approach painting this bear and his white fur. I know from plenty of experience being around polar bears that they really aren't as white as people often imagine them to be. Really, they're pretty yellow, especially in areas like their undersides. 
So I thought doing a coat of more of an ivory off-white would be a decent place to start. While that dried, I jumped back to the base. Because I was going to be taking such a big risk using the same resin that caused a horrible failure in the past and doing it on the same base, I wanted to at least do something to ensure that it would work well. The crazy foamy reaction was from moisture during the curing process. So instead of just pouring in the resin again and hoping it wouldn't react to something on the base, I thought it would be wise to mix a very small amount of the resin and brush it on first in a really thin layer to sort of seal it. This way, if there was a reaction, it would only be on a very thin layer. And sure enough, there was some small reaction, causing some of the clear resin to turn white. Thankfully, this was going to be a winter type scene and that would be totally fine. But I'm glad it happened on this thin layer and not on the full thick pour. What I'm about to do is a really bad idea. I'm fairly certain it's going to fail. This resin, I've already ruined this base with it once before. This time I've eliminated the thing that I know caused that problem. I'm not going to mix any colorant into it to cause a bunch of foamy bubbles. But even on this little test situation here, it started to turn white, which is strange because this is clear resin. I have a feeling that is a small amount of bubbles that is causing it to turn white. There are many, many resins that would be better for this purpose. And I could go out and buy some of those. But the reality is, I need to do this today, and it's Labor Day here in Canada, which means literally everything is closed. So not only can I not go buy new resin, I don't even have plastic disposable cups to mix this in, and I can't run to the store and grab any. I've managed to scrounge up two clean pill bottles to pour my resin into, and I cut up two big dropper bottles to act as plastic cups, which is a total waste. I don't know if this resin is gonna stick to these cards and not be able to be removed, I don't know if it's gonna leave some colorant from these cards. There's so many things that could go wrong here that almost surely one of them will go wrong. Wish me luck. All things considered, it turned out pretty good. There was still a fair bit of bubbles in the resin, but thankfully I was going for ice. It really did look more like ice than liquid water, so I was pretty pleased. After cutting off the lip of resin on the edges, I actually sanded the top, which made it look even more like ice. With the biggest stressor and risk of this project solidly in the rearview mirror, now is a good time to talk about the sponsor of this video. Archvillain Games makes some of the most stunningly sculpted models for at-home 3D printing I have ever seen. They are incredibly dynamic and rich in detail. They also offer a lot of really large models. Their models are available through a monthly Patreon, and the theme for September is Frostburn Horrors, and it's loaded with over 20 amazing models, most of which are giant 100 millimeter size models. There's even a hilarious special edition Goobertown Brent version of the Yeti model for just like 
reasons? I, I don't know, but it's a thing that you can have if you want it. A $10 pledge unlocks all of the themed monthly models, and it also opens up the Sinister Vault, which is an ever-growing repository of cool bonus models. All the models come pre-supported, so you can just drop them into your slicing software and be printing models in minutes. I'm telling you, this is so important. Getting access to pre-supported models was the thing that made me come to really love using this technology. Because the companies are making it basically idiot-proof. What's really neat about Archvillain's monthly service is that they have another tier. At $13.99 a month, that gives you access to a 5th edition D&D module that is themed with the month and meant to be used with the models. If you're looking for badass sculpts and want supplements to use them with in your game, this is probably the company for you. I'll put a link in the video description so you can jump on over to their page and get the models for yourself. Thanks Archvillain for sponsoring this video. Now. Time to finish my piece. I didn't want the bear just standing on a flat bit of ice, so I grabbed some XPS foam and cut a little bit of a mound. This is where the project started to get away from me a bit and where the improvisation sort of fails versus what I might have done with a better planned build. Had I planned this better, I would have put this foam in before the resin pour to look like it actually extended into and under the ice. But when you improvise, sometimes you come up with brilliant ideas. Sometimes you miss out on opportunities that better planning would provide. I put a coat of Mod Podge and white paint on the foam to seal it, and before it was even dry, I realized an error that I had made. This base actually had a face that was intended to be the front, and I put the foam on the wrong corner of the base. Rather than leaving it on and regretting the mistake, I decided to cut it off. Thankfully, the scuffed up icy surface of the resin would be pretty forgiving when it came to removing the hot glue. I made a new piece of foam and put it on the correct side and moved on. This time around, I decided to coat the foam with modeling paste instead of Mod Podge because I noticed I had a few small gaps between it and the resin, and this would work better for filling those. While it dried, I jumped back over to the bear. I mentioned earlier that polar bears actually have a surprising amount of yellow on them. And since I needed a way to give the fur some definition, I thought doing a yellow wash might be appropriate. So using some contrast paint, I went over all the fur. This was diluted about 50% with contrast medium to make it lighter. And in hindsight, I probably could have gotten away with diluting it significantly more. Now looking at the base again, as much as I liked that icy look of the resin, the more I looked at it, the more it bugged me that the whole thing was looking like three weird layers. I was trying to do a tribute to Churchill and not British Columbia, so I didn't want this to look like an Nanaimo bar. I was really wishing that the foam extended into the resin, and I thought about ways to fake this this far into the project. I probably should have left it alone, but instead I decided to mask off some of the resin with tape so that I could fill and sand some of the seams and other areas and paint the whole thing out to look like a uniform border. I spray painted it all black and hoped for the best. This worked out okay but I instantly regretted it. At this point, there was no going back though. I could start a new base with what I had learned and created something much better, but time and deadlines as usual dictated the situation and I pressed forward. I tried painting it out in ivory to see if it would look better than the black and well, it certainly looked different. But I had to put the base aside and move on to painting the bear. I figured my best bet was to just dry brush all the fur white. A better person may have taken the time to paint out each strand of fur, but I am not that person. Instead, I slowly built up the white, dry brushing on this kind of off-white bone color. Once it got as bright as it could with that color, I switched to a pure white and continued dry brushing. For the leathers, I went with the absolute quickest and easiest method possible. Snakebite Leather Contrast Paint. Say what you will about contrast paint, there's no denying it's one hell of an easy way to quickly get tabletop ready color on a model. I did a really rushed highlight on the leathers and painted out all the metallics in gunmetal. And I followed that up with a light coat of Nuln Oil. So I got a bit ballsy and gave the fur itself a wash in black Nuln Oil in the hopes that it wouldn't totally wreck it. Thankfully, it dried about how I expected, only needing a quick second white dry brushing to bring back all the white. After that, I could go in with some black and hit the areas like the paws, nose, eyes, and claws. He's a pretty big, heavy model, so I drilled a hole in his foot and glued in a bit of toothpick. 
This way I could stake him into the foam. The toothpick ended up staying in the foam instead of the foot, but that actually would make placing him back on after the snow even easier. For the snow itself, my preferred method is to make a wet slurry of snow flocking and glue. I find this looks more realistic than applying glue and just dusting the piece, which often makes it look too dry and unlike real heavy snow. The trick is really just to mix it up wet, more wet than you think it should be and sort of just slap it on. You want it to be able to set smooth under its own weight. You can finish it off by sprinkling on just a bit of the dry flock to mimic more loose kind of blowing snow. And with the snow still wet, I could place the model. This way it would naturally make him kind of disperse the snow around his feet. Once dry, I knew what I was fearing for the past few hours of working on this thing was true. The edges of this base just looked weird and kind of bad. I, I didn't like it. I had about an hour left to work on it, so I attempted to create a clean border around it using chipboard. I had recently ordered some black chipboard for exactly this sort of situation. The nice thing about super glue and chipboard is that the paper and glue combination is just dense enough that you can sand it with a nail file and kind of bevel the seams and corners and hide all the joints before painting. Considering the border was placed after all the snow effects, I was pretty happy with how cleanly I was able to pull it off. I just needed to mix up and add a tiny bit more snow around the edges and in the end, it looked pretty good. While this isn't how I do things if I were to start again from scratch, I think it was the best way to finish it off given the circumstances. For one final tiny detail, I mixed up some gloss varnish and red contrast paint and created a little bit of blood on his axe dripping onto the ice. And with a tiny flick of blood splatter on his face, I was calling him and this challenge complete. Despite all the things that I do differently a second time around, I still really like this guy and the way he turned out. And while I may not have succeeded on every aspect of this project, I finished it. And a finished project or model is always a success. If you want to grab some hobby supplies and support the channel in the process, check out blackmagiccraft.ca. I've got an essential equipment page that is a great resource for buying supplies. And if you want to help me continue making these videos, the best way you can do so is by supporting the channel on Patreon. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit the like button. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. Now, be sure to go check out the videos by my friends and see how they made out with their 24-hour dioramas. And Mills is probably going to be beautifully painted despite the time crunch. And I bet that Niels is going to have a really big, elaborate, scenic base. <laughs>